seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there was no building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. But if I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. We're talking today with Ron Hudson of Hudsonville, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right, now Ron, can you begin with some background on yourself and start with where and when were you born? I was born in Muskegon, 1950. Uh, lived there until I was two. Then my family moved to the other side of the state, to a little town called Temperance. So my dad worked for Consumers Power in Muskegon, mm -hmm. and he got a better job down there through Consumers Power. He was assistant supervisor. So spent 10 years there, and you know, went through the sixth grade. In the beginning of the seventh grade, we moved over to Holland because the the Campbell plant had opened up, it was brand new. So he got the supervisor job there, so he moved us over to Holland, and that's where I went to school and graduated from. Okay, and how many kids were in the family? There was uh, my older sister, Irene. She was uh, almost three years older than I. Uh, and I have a younger sister named Denise, and she is uh, six years younger than I am. Okay. So. Okay, when you did graduate from high school? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, and while you're in high school, I mean, it's getting in, into the mid-60s there, how much were you aware of Vietnam then? Oh, uh, just, just some, not really paying too much attention to it, you know. I had other things, school, you know, football mm -hmm. or track or whatever I did at the time, yeah. you know, just friends. So I wasn't really paying that much attention to it. Of course, I heard some of the news and seen it on TV and that. But when it got to where I was going to graduate, I graduated when I was 17. And I, uh, I, 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 I was sick of school. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't think I'd really have good enough grades in college. So uh, I enlisted. And my dad helped me because I couldn't go until I was 18. So he helped. Okay, because when you're, when you're 17, you need a parent to sign for you yeah, so that yeah. you can go in the and service. That's what he did, yeah. All right. Uh, and which branch of the service did you join? Marine Corps. Okay, and why did you pick the Marines? Uh, I figured if I was going to go to Vietnam, I wanted to be as tough as I could get. And I figured they would treat me the, tr the toughest. <laughs> so I wanted, to, I wanted to be ready to go. All right. Uh, and then uh, when do you uh, start basic training? Um, August 28, 1969, All right. in San Diego. Okay. Now, how did you get down to San Diego? Uh, they, they flew us down mm -hmm. out of Detroit. First went there uh, when I first signed up to uh, take the physical, right. like everybody else. And uh, I, don't, I, I was expecting to go for four years, but they said, you're going for two, so... As it worked out, I'm glad it was only two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now, when you did the f what, went to the, for the physical originally, uh, were there were there all enlistees going there, or were there just anybody who happened to be? They were in? both. Yeah, mm -hmm. enlisted and and guys kicking and screaming. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> did you notice anybody trying to scam the system or, or find a way to get out of it? I I didn't really. I I wasn't looking for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just. Kind of, like I said, at 17, I'm going, what's right. going on here? Okay. Uh, do you think the physical was, 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 you know, very seriously done, or was it just quick run through and make sure you could no, breathe? No, it, it, it took all day, you know, mm -hmm. of, I think it was two days, actually. Okay. So, yeah, they were, they were pretty thorough. All right. Uh, and then when you fly down, you, you fly down to, to San Diego. Were you just passengers on a regular commercial jet then when you went to San Diego? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then what happened when you got to San Diego? Well, we got off the plane, and they took us uh, by bus to the, the, the San Diego Depot, or whatever mm -hmm. they call it, and uh, had us uh, line up on the curb and waited for the, the bus. You know, we had to stand at attention. We, had, we were getting our training already as soon as we got to San Diego. Okay. Then, so were you getting that, that kind of treatment in the airport already, or? 
Or no. did you wait until you actually got onto yeah. the depot? Yeah, on, uh, yeah. yeah. Then, then the, uh, the uh, drill instructors started showing up. And they put us on a bus and took us to San Diego, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, uh, the base yeah. there. And uh, it was a pretty nice, much of an all night, night, all night deal. They, uh, <laughs> you know, they cut your hair and they uh, made you give up all your clothes and everything and put you in the fatigues that they gave you the green ones, you know. And pretty much uh, just I was thinking, what did I get myself into? What did I do this for? <laughs> well, had you known anything or been told anything about Marine Corps boot camp before you went in? Not, not really too much. Just it was supposed to be the toughest. Right. Okay. The toughest one to go, you know. Yeah, and I guess, and so they, so you actually get arrive at the the base at, at at night then, and they just are putting you through all of this stuff in the middle of the night. Yeah, you getting know. your getting your new. They give you a sea bag to put your new clothes and boots and everything in and okay. then we got back we got to the billets we got assigned bunks or racks they call them and uh, um, when that happened uh, well like you know it was like two o'clock in the morning so at about 3.30 I think it was uh, they they charged in there, the drill instructors charged in there, started tipping over racks. <laughs> they were double racks, you know. And bang, bang, everybody was hitting the floor, and they were yelling and screaming, get up, uh, let's go, you know. <laughs> All right. Now, and, uh, did they start with the training right away, or did you have to do tests and things first, or? No, they, they started pretty much with the training. We started with the physical training right away. Right. They, they wanted to... I see it now, I did at the time, but they, they wanted to break you down and rebuild you, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's what they did. Okay. And how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to that? I was, I, I was homesick a little bit at first, you know, but I realized, well, I'm in it. I, I got to go through with it. So, and my dad had told me before I had left, he said, just remember one thing, keep telling yourself, when it gets too tough for everybody else, it's getting just right for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, get that thought in your head and stay tough. Now, had he been in the service himself? Yeah, he was an uh, uh, Army sergeant, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was one other place he went to. I remember, he was also a truck driver. And uh, yeah, he was in it for about four years. He mm -hmm. was in during okay. pretty much the length pretty much of the, the war. war. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, so you know you, you had at least that in, in your head. Now, were there other guys who were trying to push back or fight the system or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was slackers that wanted to get out, and they they either dealt with them by putting them in a special unit uh, where they get special treatment, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, or they would you know they would uh, kick them out with a with a. Uh, Dishonorable, or a, or a, what's the other one? The, the, when you're sick, the yeah, medical medical profile or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah they they get them out, you know. Mm -hmm. But did most of the guys get through? Oh yeah, yeah, majority did. Yeah, we right. only had like two in our platoon platoon that that got okay. got gone. And so, what was the daily routine in boot camp? Uh, usually, we're up before daylight and doing some running. I usually ran, I don't know, five, ten miles. I don't know. I don't remember how far it was. And then it was breakfast. And right at first, they give you 30 seconds to eat breakfast. You know, everybody got their tray and set it down in front of them. They stood there at attention. And then they said, uh, okay, you got 30 seconds. Eat. <laughs> and you just either start shoveling in. Some guys, of course, at that point were like, I can't eat, you know. <laughs> But me, I can always eat. I eat <laughs> as fast as I could. <laughs> All right. And then once you do that, uh, is it more training yep. or classroom yep. work? Or? Yeah. Or there'd be laundry to do or whatever. They, they had you do everything, a lot of drill, you know, uh, marching. Uh, because there was always kind of a contest between the drill instructors of other units to see who, 
who could make their guys uh, more elite. Okay. And what sort of impression did you have of your own drill instructors? Uh, it kind of scared me. <laughs> These guys were in really good shape. And one of them actually got out there the first, one of the first days we were there and said, if there's any one of you here now that thinks you can take me, come on up here and we'll decide right now, one at a time. <laughs> I take all I got. <laughs> Nobody went up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there were 17, 18 year old kids. These guys are probably in their 30s, been in shape like yep. this for their whole life. And, uh, I didn't think I could take them, so mm -hmm. I didn't go. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, did they, they treat you the same way the whole way through? Was, was this an eight-week program you were in? or I was in uh, boot camp for 13 weeks. Okay, 13 weeks. Now, during the 13 weeks, did you ever go up to Camp Pendleton, or were you just in San Diego the whole time? Yeah, we went up to P Camp Pendleton for a couple weeks to do uh, uh, training on rifles and, uh, and pistols. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, you know, get the whole nomenclature of it down. I mean, taking them apart, put them back together, do it as fast as you can, you know. Uh, clean them, that's, that's one of their big deals there. You got to keep that rifle clean all the time, you know. No, and they, they inspect it with white gloves. Mm -hmm. So, you know it had to be clean. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, did you ever get yourself uh, in, in trouble or, or become the, the, the target uh, in, for the in instructors? Bucamp? Yeah. Uh, well, everybody did to a certain extent. They had to pick on everybody, mm -hmm. pretty much. So, yeah, I got a few slaps up beside the head. <laughs> We're not staying in step or, or whatever, you know. One of uh, the drill instructors, one of his favorite punishments was you, you hold your rifle on the backs of your hands like this, and you hold it there until he says you can put it down. Of course, you're, you're starting to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, you know. And when you did that, then you walk over to you and grab a little piece of fat right there and <laughs> pinch and twist. And you can hold that up there longer, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, he wasn't using those words, but. No. <laughs> All right. Now, were any of your instructors people who'd been to Vietnam already? Yeah, yeah, all, of, all three of them had been to Vietnam. Yeah, we had three of them. Yeah. And did they tell you much about it, or did you just know they were there? Uh, they, they, not. Not like the real story of it, mm -hmm. but they, they would tell you, well, you know, if, if you're going to be over there, you could get shot by Mama San, or, and, and Jody back home is going to take your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, a lot of it was just uh, brain, you know, games. Right. You know, just trying to make you tougher. Okay. You know. All right. Uh, and then what happens then at the end of the 13 weeks? Then I went to uh, went to Camp Pendleton, and um, for some reason, they put. Well, at that time, we had already been tested mm -hmm. and had received what job we were going to do over there. And I was uh, truck driver. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the MO number, yeah. but uh, then. Uh, <clears throat> Now, when you found out you were a truck driver, did you think that was a good thing or a bad thing, or did you yeah, not really know? Yeah, well, when I took the test, they had questions like, do you like to hike? Do you like to hike in the mountains? Do you like to carry your camp on your back? And I said, nope. nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> then they'd show you a picture of a motor or, a, you know, something on, on a truck or whatever. <laughs> that, that was right. I checked them right, you know. So it did work. Uh, I, yeah, I was I was glad to be. But of course, I didn't know. I didn't think at the time about uh, road mines and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That didn't enter my mind. Just yeah. enter my mind. I'm going to be holding a steering wheel instead of a rifle. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, uh, did they give? So you, you went up to uh, Pendleton. And now, did you do? Did you go through the kind of infantry training at Pendleton? Or yep. Yeah, we did. Yeah. A lot of hiking, a lot of force marching uh, up into the mountains. They had uh, rifle ranges up there. Went and did shooting at night with every other round being a tracer. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, that was kind of interesting because I've always liked guns and and that. And that, that was real interesting. And then uh, after that, they uh, they sent me home for uh, 30 days. Mm -hmm. And when I came back. Uh, I went to a truck driver training school, 
where we drove everything from the little Jeeps to the 10 ton. Okay, uh, and where was the truck driver training? That was there someplace on Camp Pendleton, okay. you know. I, I never really knew because, you know, every time you you go someplace, you take a bus, you know. Right. So as you can really see okay. it. You but just, it's still Pendleton, you're still in California, you're not yeah, someplace else. Yeah, right, right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, now, how much experience, I mean, did you have when you were growing up? I mean, did you work on cars or things like that? Yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like doing my own mechanical work. But back then you could. You didn't yeah. need computers. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you, I don't know, and then, okay, so you got, you're trying on the trucks and, and, and things like that. Um, now. When you were doing the different stages of training after boot camp, was there any point where they tried to really teach you something about what Vietnam was going to be like, or was that only after you go over, or? No, well, they would, they would say certain things to you about, you know, what it's like in, in Vietnam. Uh, but, you know, the one, one drill star said, you're not really going to understand it until you get there. Mm -hmm. And he said, just be as cool as you can when you first get there because you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You got to be there a while to find out. And he was right, you know. Okay. Now, how long was the truck driver training? I think that was, uh, I think it was th six weeks, okay. a month or six weeks, something like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, and once that's finished, do you go home again, or do you go to Vietnam? No, or? no. Then I went to staging. Okay. And uh, I was in the motor pool, and we took care of all the, the vehicles there and until they said, "Okay, it's time to go." You know. And then they loaded us on the plane, and we were off. Stopped in Hawaii to refuel, and then okay. on to Dan Da Nang. Okay. Did you fly in a chartered commercial plane? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was a commercial plane. Yep. Right. And did you fly out of uh, San Diego or El Toro or someplace else? Of uh, Norton Air Force Base, up farther north in okay. California. All right. And I flew back into there too. Okay. All right. Um, now, what's what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get to Da Nang? Oh, when I stepped out of the plane. It, it was like somebody took a hot, wet blanket and just threw it at you, covered you with it. It was just whew, hard to breathe. It was just so hot. Okay. Now was, it, was it day or night when you got there? It was day. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and was anything going on? or? Not right there at the moment, okay. but I had, we talked to other guys that had been there for a while, and they said, oh, yeah, we get hit every once in a while. They're they always repairing the runway, you know. Okay. Now, when did you actually get to Vietnam? And what month or? Like the, like the, the day, you mean like well, day, April? Month. It was April something. Okay, but a April 69? Yeah, April 69, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was just after the Tet Offensive. Yeah, I guess, well, the Tet Offensive is early 68, and then there's a couple of later pieces of it. So yeah. mo most of 68 was, was, yeah. was fairly Yeah, I was ugly. after that. And you, you got an after that. Okay, so you land in Da Nang, get off the plane, what do they do with you? Uh, you stand in line, like, <laughs> that's 60% of what you do in the Marine Corps, <laughs> stand in line. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they just give you, uh, like, um, uh, camouflage, fatigue stuff, mm -hmm. boots, like, you know, stuff like that. They issue your gun right there. Okay. And yeah. what kind of weapon did they give you? Well, they said uh, you being a truck driver and you're getting in a truck all the time, you may carry a, a, a 45, a 1911, mm -hmm. 45. I said, oh, that, that sounds good, you know. It's, don't have to have it in my hands and that, you know. And shortly after... I don't know, I was probably there two, three months, something like that. Uh, we did get uh, ambushed by, uh, I, we don't even know how many there were. They were up on the mountain, you know, shooting down mm -hmm. at us, and uh, everybody stopped. I don't know why I stopped. I would have put the gas pedal on <laughs> in the front row. But I was behind everybody, so I had to stop. And we, we got out, and everybody was shooting their rifles up at them, and I was, 
I looked at this gun, and anything ain't going to make it halfway mm -hmm. up there, you know. So when I got back, I asked the captain if it was all right to switch that out for an M16. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> to reach out and touch well, That's one of the things you learn. <laughs> okay. So you get there, you, you get, they issue you a weapon, all right. And do they assign you to a unit? Yeah, yeah. I was assigned to a uh, M105 uh, battery, which is a kind of like a tank. It's on treads. Okay. So but it's, a, it's got, you know, the big barrel out here. So it's a self-propelled gun, basically. Yeah, yeah, but but they had them uh, stationary in berms. Okay. And uh, they were 105s because the rounds weighed 105, 105 pounds for each round. Usually that number is for the diameter in millimeters of the shell. Oh, well, yeah, uh, that's, that's true. 105 millimeter howitzer, yeah. But they, but they were heavy shells. That's true. So these are yeah. good-sized guns. But they were... They were. They said they weighed 105 pounds too. So I just kind of always thought, yeah. that's a good way to remember it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it felt like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're you're assigned to the gun battery, but you're a truck driver. Right. Right. Like like I told you before in there that you know you you don't just do one thing in a Marine Corps. They they they've always. I think that's where the the civilians got cross crossover trainings from them. Marine Corps, they wanted you to know different stuff, mm -hmm. you know, all different stuff. Yeah. So, because because all all Marines are riflemen first. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, so can... yeah, I went on uh, mine sweeps, and uh, okay, you know, well, you know, just different different kind of jobs, you know. All right. Now, where was your unit stationed when you joined it? Let's... They were in. They were in the at the rock pile, okay. north of Dong, Dong Ha. Okay. And for a general audience here, so where in South Vietnam is Dong Ha? Uh, that's, that's about 18 miles, 10 or 18 miles. I can't really remember mm -hmm. the, the distance. South of the DMZ, okay. which is the very northern yeah. line. Yeah. And then, right. Then from there, they took me to the rock pile, and, and that's where... I, I was stationed right. there at Rock Pile for the next several months. Okay, and then how close is the Rock Pile to? That's three miles south of DMZ. Okay, so you... Just a great big rock formation that comes out of the ground. Uh, they had room up there for like 11 guys, and, uh, you know, you, they, they could see North Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, from being way up there like that. Okay. So there was a surveillance, and um, once in a while the, the uh, Vietnamese... Uh, would try and climb that, you know. So we were we were firing at them right from there, which was just like across the road, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, okay, so your unit, your the, the, your guns are basically they're sort of dug in, sort of at the base of. You're not actually up on the rock. You're sort of on the flat ground around right, it, right? Right. Okay. You're down below. Yeah. In a berm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those those would go uh, like 11 miles. They would shoot. Right, and um, so what is your main assignment there? What, what's your main job? That was to bring in all their, the food they needed, the beer they needed, the ammo they needed, any clothes or anything. I, I went and got it, okay. either Dong Ha or uh, Vandergriff, which was uh, Quezon. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so you're kind of basically driving back and forth uh, right. a, a lot. And, Right. Not not really long. Would you ever drive down as far as, as Da Nang or Phu Bai no. or someplace like that? Okay. No, nope, never okay. drove. It was, it was just Dong Ha. They they brought everything up we needed from from farther south. Right. I picked it up in Dong Ha. Okay. And how many trucks did your unit have? I think we had uh, I think we had five. Okay. Five. And they were all they were all one ton or uh, not one ton. Uh, were they deuce and a half or no? They were five ton. Five, five ton trucks. trucks. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, what was your, what was a, a, a typical day like for you there? Sweating, <laughs> but yeah, it was. You know, you get up, you go to the mess hall in the morning, and you know, if they got something, I got to go get. You know, I'd, I'd go. Usually, we we very seldom went alone with just one truck. We would take two, three trucks, and, and you know, just just because it looked like we. <laughs> Know what we're doing, I guess. Right. Okay. Uh, now, do the when you're driving, I mean, is it just 
do you have anything escorting you or would it just be the trucks by themselves or yeah it was just us trucks yeah okay. once in a while there'd be a, the captain might want to go back he'd be in the jeep up at the mm -hmm. head of the column but uh usually it was just just the trucks and I, i've done it alone too just just me you know okay and when you were driving the trucks would there be two of you in the cab or just one driver just one just okay. one person the driver yeah all right yeah. And were the did the trucks? I mean, did, they, did you have any weapons besides just the driver's personal weapons? And did they ever have machine guns on them or anything like that? No. Nope. Okay. No, nope. just just the M16, and you know how the handle of the M16 on top is. Well, this, these trucks had uh, these these screws. You know, they're about that long, and you could twist and turn, and the window would come out. Mm -hmm. You know, swing up. So you. Uh, oh, let me shut this off. Uh, the uh, window would uh, come up so you get air right in mm -hmm. on you like that. Well, if you turn the, the knobs just right, you could take your M16 and just hang the handle over it. So it's just the pointing down, mm -hmm. and it's right there. All you got to do is grab it up off there, you know. So that's that's basically what it was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, what's the first indication you have when you get to Vietnam? But you're in a war zone. I mean, how do you start to notice? In what ways do you start to notice that you're in the middle of something? Uh, they pick on you because you're a new guy. Okay. <laughs> so you know you're you're in for something because everybody that comes in gets the new guy treatment. You know. Okay. Well, now what does that consist of? <laughs> well, anything from a kick in the pants to. Uh, you know, you got my guard duty tonight, you know. <laughs> right. How long does that last? Oh, I don't know. I think, you know, just basically till the next new guys get there. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. you're, you're rotating, this is the system now, where you're rotating men, men in and out all the time. So right. you're joining men who've been there for a while <laughs> uh, and so forth. Now, when you get there, did anybody uh, explain to you what you're supposed to do or how things worked? Uh, I don't really remember too much instruction. Just, mm -hmm. They just said, you go where they tell you. Okay. Get what they tell you. Okay. Uh, and was it easy enough to navigate in Vietnam? I mean, did you know where you had to go? It, it, well, well, yeah, I knew where I had to go. It wasn't very long because, of course, uh, when they were first new, they don't send you by yourself. Right. You got to be there for a while. But um, I, uh, I thought... Uh, uh, what was I going to say? Um, was the, this? I was going to tell you something. I forgot what it was. It was. Easy, I was asking what sort of easy, how easy or hard it was to kind of oh, get around. Oh, yeah. There. Okay. Well, that the roads were rough, really rough. So you couldn't just go barreling down them, you know. I, I did a little bit of that at first, but the batteries were in a box on the other side of the truck. And all I had was like in a drawer that turn, you turn this one knob to lock it in. But the vibration and bouncing would turn that lock down, and pretty quick that box would be jumping out there, and then there goes your batteries. <laughs> I, did it. I did that two or three times until the captain uh, called me in and said, uh, you're costing us a lot of money in batteries. <laughs> you quit that. <laughs> okay. So the battery flies out of the thing, and then you just have to sit there and wait for someone to bring no, up another no. battery? No, these are, these are diesels. They run without the batteries. Okay. Once they're started, they run without batteries. <laughs> All right. So I could make it back. But then I had to go tell the captain I needed new batteries. Okay. He didn't like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, and can you describe a little bit the... Um, sort of base you're at, at at Dong Ha or what kind of quarters your unit had or what your living conditions were like? Uh, in Dong Ha or yeah. in the rock pile? Rock pile, I guess, because that's you're there most of the time, Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, that's where I was most of the time. Um, we had uh, dug down into the ground and then built um, sandbags, stacked sandbags up over you know, it was like a little underground igloo, only a hot igloo. <laughs> and, and did you have sandbag? Did you have a roof with sandbags, or just just canvas, or? No, there was, there was dirt and sandbags. Okay. Over so, you, so, so you really had you had kind of more of a bunker almost. Yeah, like a bunker. You're, yeah. You're, you're living in, so it's not right. just a hooch. Now, when you're right. back at Dong Ha, did you have a kind of wooden canvas hooch? Yeah, or? yeah, that was made out of plywood and. Uh, 
a corrugated metal for roof, mm -hmm. rooftops. And uh, yeah, it was a little better living back then, a little better chow and, mm -hmm. and that, you know. Okay. Now, how much uh, contact do you actually have with the enemy when, when you're in either of these bases? How often did they show up? Um, I, I don't know if I've really ever seen a, a true, you know, North Vietnam right. or, or black pajama, are... you know. Um, like I say, we got shot at, yeah. so we know we, they were up there, but you can't see them. You know, it's all right. fo foliage, foliage and, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, uh, and, you know, they were shooting at us, we were shooting at them. That only happened a couple of times in a uh, uh, driving truck. Uh, they they uh, did try and hit us once on a mine sweep, but it, it always whenever I was in one, it was just shooting a little bit, then it quit. Right. They they would go away. Yeah. Would they? They, yeah. they didn't want to keep pressing it. I guess you know. Yeah. Well, that was a stage where that area is is, is fairly well secure. They. Yeah. Were there enemy trying to move through the area to get farther south? They they were, but it was it was more like over in Laos. They mm -hmm. had the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right. you know, right. down there. So they could they could bypass us plenty good where mm -hmm. they wouldn't get shot at. Right. And like I said before, they uh, uh, you know they they're headed for other places down south of us, mm -hmm. like way and wherever they're going, Da Nang, yeah. wherever, they, to cause trouble, so they're loaded for bear. And on the way back, they, they're packing a little light because they've set off most of their ordnance, you mm -hmm. know? And so they drop a few mortars or rockets or whatever in on us as they were going by just to say, we're still here, you know? All right. Now, did the bases you were on uh, ever get hit by enemy sappers? They try to infiltrate the base and blow things up. They did over at uh, Quezon, mm -hmm. but they no, they never hit uh, sappers. Never hit us. No. Okay. We had uh, all the uh, like I say, we had the American nine-inch guns. We had our 105s. We had uh, the CBs, and across the street was another Army Army battery. And I can't mm -hmm. remember what those those guys were, but uh, we we had. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, I don't know what you, you'd call it, just uh, no, nothing. Uh, you got a little uh, bit of harassment fire here and there. Yeah, there, that, that was it. You know, nobody that I know of ever got hit there, any wound, wounded there. I, I don't think we were in a place where they wanted to take over that. Yeah. They, they just, they, we were, they, we just weren't nothing there but uh, like uh, an outpost. Of course, we were firing uh, in across the, the yeah. DMZ, of course, because those guns would fire that far, you know. Now, did you're in Canada. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> Oh, no, actually, by now you can, no problem. It's, yeah, it's over with. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and it's not like they follow the rules anyway. No, that's right, they didn't. Okay. Now, did you have a, a bunker line or a perimeter that you had to man? Or was that where, did you have a when Yeah, you had we, had the, we had the Army grunts when they were there. Mm -hmm. When they weren't out in the bush, they surrounded the outside of our fence. Right. And they camped out there. And they come in and used our... Uh, uh, you know, uh, mess hall, right. stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we were pretty well protected. Okay. All right. Now, uh, when you're out on the road, was it was it mostly pretty safe to drive from one place to another at that point? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, you know, 90-some percent, it was never no problem, you know. Okay. And you mentioned you got a couple of times when they would take a few shots at you from someplace. Mm -hmm. and that yeah, was... I think it was just harassment. Right. And, and, then... and there was uh, uh, road mines, too, that they'd put there at night. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, they always tried to sweep, sweep it before any trucks or anything went, went through there. And uh, I remember one time I was uh, behind another truck that set one off. And it blew the right front tire off of the truck, the wheel and everything. And uh, so we just got him. Mm -hmm. But that driver, he was okay. He wasn't hurt. Got him, and we left the truck there for, 
Uh, we see we were empty going in yeah. to Don Ha. Okay. They, they would have been better off to do something like that on the way out because mm -hmm. then it's full of <clears throat> yeah. stuff. <laughs> Although it couldn't have been too big a mine if it just blew a wheel off. No, than... it wasn't. No, no. And I don't know how they missed it because they, they mine sweeped it every morning. You know, either they missed it or they come in afterwards and put a quick one down. Yeah. You know. Okay. But, now you said you also did some mine sweeping yourself. Yeah. And yeah. So I wasn't the mine sweeper. Right. I was just one of the grunts at the time that followed and we, we usually got on each side of the road in single file and they were up ahead with their sweep, you know. Once in a while they'd find <coughs> one to, you know, halt, you know, mm -hmm. wait till they blow this mine. So we'd just sit down, have a smoke and wait till they blew that up, you know. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now what sort of um, relationship did you have with your officers or your senior sergeants? What was the mood in the, in the unit like? Well, yeah, the, the captain I had there, I don't think he liked me too much. <laughs> but I don't think he liked anybody too much. <laughs> well, I wasn't worried about it. But mostly it was uh, uh, corporals and sergeants right above me that, that I had to deal with, that they dealt dealt with me, you know, mm -hmm. and had to do what they said, so. And were they a decent bunch of guys, or? Yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them were good. Uh, you know, some were guys that wouldn't uh, ask you to do anything they wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Those kind, of, those guys I trusted, you know. But there were a few that wanted you to do stuff that they wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. Mainly, mainly when you first get there, it's uh, uh, burn, burn the, the crappers, you know, mm -hmm. slide that bowl, that big, t uh, it's like cut down 55 gallon right. drum and pour diesel fuel in it and set it on fire, you know. Yeah, the, the, the shit burning detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, did you have uh, Vietnamese civilians who would be in the camps and work there? In Dong Ha, there were a few. Mm -hmm. But not a rock pile. Not they the weren't. Rock pile. They okay. weren't allowed inside the fence, at all. Uh, now outside of the rock pile, I mean, were there, was there a civilian camp or village or something, or was that all just military? There? Not real close to us. Okay. They were kind of like halfway in back to Dong Ha. Mm -hmm. There was a village that he drove through. Uh, but yeah, there wasn't. There wasn't many Vietnamese people right around. Right, because that's get awfully close to the DMZ at that point, and they would have moved a lot of yeah. the population yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, they didn't want to be where it was hot either, you know, okay. where it was, and I don't mean weather hot, yeah. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> now, was there a village next to Dong Ha, I mean, or a camp of some kind? I, I, I seem to remember there was, but I, I really, I, I had nothing to do with it. Okay. I don't know if it was because it was Army or just a different... Oh, oh, so mili oh, Vietnamese military camp, that is. Oh, I, oh. I was asking about just civilians, or were there civil was there a civilian village or something like that around there still? Yeah, yeah, back in Dong Ha mm -hmm. there, we were camped on, well, it would be the, uh, west side of the road, mm -hmm. and then just across the road on the other side, there was a river, and they had a pretty good sized village there, and, uh, some of the some of the guy these guys were they would come in and, and be a barber mm -hmm. or something like that for you know for a while and then they'd go back out but they but they had to go through a certain amount right. of clearances you know yeah. because that kind of stuff yeah okay uh, now when people who don't know much about it think about Vietnam there's certain because there's stereotypical images and ideas that that, that show up uh, mm. I, I've I've had people who have said things, oh, you know, they were all strung out on drugs or, or, or worse. Oh. <laughs> I mean, how much, I mean, how much drug use was actually going on that you could observe? Oh, there was pot, mm -hmm. uh, tie stick, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what is around, tie, but there tie was, stick? There wasn't any really heavy duty stuff. Okay. Like, so they're not, not heroin? Not there, that but, I knew. Okay. Yeah, heroin or cocaine or, I never come across okay. any of that stuff. Okay. And when guys were smoking pot, was that was just when they were off duty? Yeah, or? yeah. Yeah, we didn't do that when we were out on, on uh, like, minesweepers. I, yeah. I, I yeah. know I wouldn't because it makes you feel too tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, did you get a, a 
a, a beer ration too? I mean, did yeah, yeah, you could have like two beers a night or something like that. Yeah, but me picking up the beer, I I would uh, hide a case every once in a while in the truck, and then when we ran out of beer, you know, everybody gets grumpy and you know, there ain't no beer out here. We can't mm -hmm. drink nothing. And well, I'd bring this case out, say, look what we got. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> could, now, could you ever barter stuff or trade for other stuff? Or did I, just... I never did. Okay. No. I'm sure that was going on, but. Now, did they have an enlisted <clears throat> men's club uh, out at the rock pile or just back in Dong Ha? Yeah, just back in Dong Ha. The rock pile, we just had the mess. Yeah. The mess tent, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that, but yep. that was made out of wood, too. Okay. And uh, they show movies in there. Mm -hmm. And. You'd get a new one, new movie every, oh, month. <laughs> <laughs> right. I watched The Graduate there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hundred times. <laughs> I don't, did they make you watch the John Wayne movie about the Green Berets? Or yeah, what? yeah, we've seen that yeah, one. Yeah, well, that, yeah. Was a, that shows up a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you get to any USO shows? Yeah, there was back in Dong Ha, uh, like it was some kind of Filipino or or something. I'm not sure what they were. Yeah. Uh, girls, you know. Uh, and were they singing American songs or? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were pretty entertaining. Had like an MC, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was kind of in, 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 in control of stuff. Right. And he was kind of funny, you know. So. Okay. Yeah, it was it was kind of a nice break. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to go real bad, you know. Okay. Uh, how long did you actually spend in Vietnam? Uh, from April of uh, 69 to November, I think. April yeah. from May, June, July, August, September, October, November. So like about yeah. seven months or so, yeah. Eight, I think it's eight months. Okay. Right? So uh, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, yeah. yeah. Now, did, you get an, did you get any kind of R&R &R during that time or did you just? I was just about to get up to where I could take R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to either Hawaii or Thailand or something like that. But when we got the orders that the 3rd Marine Division was going to start pulling out, they said all, all R&R &R has been canceled. Okay. So I never did get to go. Didn't get to do that. Okay. Uh, now, get back in, in the unit again, but sort of another one of the things that uh, you know, gets talked about are you know, race relations and things like that. Um, what was the ethnic mix in your, the unit you were with? Were there many black guys or Hispanics? Oh in yeah, there? yeah, we had all kinds. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, they did kind of, kind of stick together mm -hmm. with their own race, but there wasn't any problem with uh, mixing either. I, yeah. I had good, I had a good friend there. His name was Andy Anderson, and uh, I never know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. I haven't been in contact with him at all. Well, we were we were close friends. He was a black guy, mm -hmm. and and uh, yeah, most of them I got along with, mm -hmm. just, just like I do in life now. I yeah. get along with most people, yeah. unless they don't want to get along. Okay. <laughs> now uh, you were mentioning before that you you did a variety of things. You're, you're doing minesweep duty. You're, you're driving the truck. You know, you've got to do perimeter guard or other kinds of duty. Um, now you also helped out with the artillery battery itself. Yeah. Uh, Can you? We. They trained us to shoot the guns too, just like the uh, artillery guys, and because uh, you need three three guys and a gun, and there was room in there for uh, the one guy that had the headset on mm -hmm. taking the coordinates, right. and uh, then there was a guy on the other side of the gun handling the ammo and the powder, handing it off to the guy that was behind the gun, and he he fed it in there and slammed the door shut and got out of the way and they pulled the lanyard and usually most of the time it was just fire when they they told you to from uh, from yeah. the com com room right then you fired when they told you but once twice maybe we had fire uh, for effect mm -hmm. and it was just as quick as you could just load it and fire it load it and fire it it got real smoky inside mm -hmm. there and you know it wasn't real stable either because when those guns shot, they'd come back into the 
uh, machine itself, yeah. you know. So did this have an enclosed turret that the gun yeah. was mounted in? Yeah, okay. it was enclosed, yeah. yeah. So you're inside this sort of steel box thing, yeah. firing a big old gun yeah. with the... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what would... If you were helping a gun crew, were you handling the ammo or...? Mostly, yeah. Okay. Mostly. I wasn't trained for the, the comm right, right. stuff, you know, communication stuff. So, yeah, I just, I either got it and handed it off or I threw it in there and slammed the mm -hmm. breach shut. Okay. So the fire for effect would be sort of a combat where combat support situation where there's some unit out there that needs some help and you're doing that. Right. M most of the time, do you think they were just doing sort of harassment interdiction fire where you just fire a few shots someplace or... I, I think there was some of that, yeah. Yeah, they never really told us sure. much, you know. Uh, but yeah, we, we did a lot, uh, especially if they were, they, they looked like they were gonna come across the DMZ mm -hmm. in our neck of the woods. Yeah, we'd, we'd fire and try and hold them. Just say, you know, try another way in, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but of course, you know, they're out in the, in the pucker brush, you can't see them, mm -hmm. so you don't know really what, what you're doing to them, you know, whether you're getting them or not, mm -hmm. but they, they, of course, they got all the coordinates, so if you're hitting that coordinates and that's where they're at, they're, they're okay. going to get hit. You know? All right. Now, you said you're going to go back, you, 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 at Dong Ha a lot, and that's along the coast, and then the rock pile is sort of a little bit, little bit farther north, a little bit more inland, but then you also went out the Vandegrift base out, out to the Kisan area, mm -hmm. which is farther west up in the hills. Um, was that a more dangerous route to travel than the one to Dong Ha, or was it pretty quiet when you were taking that? Eh, I'd say it was only dangerous because the road was so bad. Okay. I mean, that thing had holes, potholes, and you know, the CBs were there to take care of that, but they couldn't always be out there working mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, when there's the. Vietnamese are trying to shoot them, you know, you, you know, kind of makes you quit working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that was a rough road going from there to uh, Vandegrift. Okay. That's where I lost most of my batteries. <laughs> All right. Now you also mentioned that not long after you got there, a typhoon went through. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it would, it was so, uh, wind was so, I'd never been in any kind of hurricane, or been tornadoes. This, this was, uh, I don't know how many days it went on, just blowing and raining and filled up all of our our bunkers, you know, water, you'd be mm -hmm. in the bunker sitting in water. You know, it was it was nasty. One, one time it, it blew one of those corrugated metal roofs off there, and I don't know what the guy was doing outside in the storm, but it, it cut him right in half and, mm -hmm. you know, I think, wow, well, you come over here to fight the enemy yeah. and then you get you get killed by a, mm -hmm. a freak accident, you know. That's kind of hard to take, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to die, but if I died, I wanted to, be, I wanted to die fighting somebody and doing right. something, you know. But most of the time, you're pretty distant from many actual combat, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't really yeah. see any of that yourself. No, no, no. I never went out in the jungle. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> no, my 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 brother-in-law did. He he was a uh, communications guy with a radio on his mm -hmm. back and that, that yep. whip, you know. Yep. He went out with the grunts and uh, he saw quite a bit. But no, I I'd have to say uh, I was very very lucky. Your God was watching out for me. Uh, I didn't I didn't really ever get hurt or. Okay. Now you look over that that period you actually spent in Vietnam. Are there particular memories or things that stand out in your mind that you haven't brought into the story yet? Um, well, there was um, uh, one time when we were on uh, 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 minesweep, uh, and, and I don't want to know why, but they had told us before that these, these water buffaloes, they, they don't like the smell of Americans. That's what they told mm -hmm. us. I don't know if that's true or, but you see these little kids, you know, pulling them around by the nose mm -hmm. ring, you know, and riding them and stuff like that. So, you know, they, they were like babies, mm -hmm. you know, towards them, but they did not like us. And we had one charge our line once and they started shooting up ahead 
I was back a ways. I didn't know what was going on at first. But they started shooting, and this, this bull that was coming at our line, we were walking like this. He was coming like this at an angle. And when they sh started shooting him, then he turned and kept running right down our line, and everybody <laughs> getting shots at him. You know, finally he, he dropped, because, well, you know, I got to have 16. Yeah. They're not really for killing big animals mm -hmm. like that. They're for killing men, you know. And uh, finally he dropped down. We all went over our course and inspected it, and we counted 58 bullet holes. Oh. <laughs> Took a lot to kill that boy. <laughs> but he had one of them big horns mm -hmm. that come out, you know, dangerous animal. I I was driving back to the uh, uh, rock pile from Dong Ha one time. I was by myself, and there was a one of these uh, water buffalo standing in the road, and I stopped. You know, thought, well, I'll, I'll wait a minute, and mm -hmm. he'll wander off. You know, but he just stood there, yep. <laughs> just kept standing there looking at me up at that truck. And I, What's your problem? <laughs> so I, I inched ahead, just inched. A little bit hit that because I got a big flat bumper on mm -hmm. the front of that, you know, and just bumped him a little bit in the rear end, and he let out a bellow, <laughs> turned around and took my fender, <laughs> bent that up, <laughs> and curled it. I thought, whoa, if he could bend that fender, what do we to do to me? So, but he got out of the way then. He was off to the side, mm -hmm. and I took off. <laughs> I go mess with him. <laughs> All right. So the local wildlife was a principal hazard then. Yeah, yeah. I see a few uh, big snakes crossing the road. You know, I, I stopped for one of them one time too. He was going slowly across the road. And I said, eh, I don't know why if I ran over him, that probably wouldn't be a good thing. So I just waited. <laughs> he at least kept moving. So. Yeah, he okay. kept going. All right. Uh, now, okay. Now how? Quickly, did you um, leave Vietnam after you found out? And how does the process get? Because you said your unit, the Third Marine Division, was officially rotating back uh, out of Vietnam. Right. And this is part of President Nixon's effort to show you that we're all pulling out. So you say, okay, Third Marine Division goes out. Right. Uh, and were they kind of looking around for all the guys who had completed over six months or something like that to take all of you out, or did your whole unit go at the same time? Yeah, our whole unit went. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we uh, went to, uh, I keep wanting to say Kantian, but is that right on the... Uh, Kantian is up, that's up pretty close to is Dong Ha, yeah. Is that, uh, is that right on the ocean? Yeah. This this place was right on the ocean, and uh, but before all this, we had to prepare to get on the, uh, our, they sent a uh, LSD mm -hmm. flat bottom cargo carrier. Right. We were going to put our M105s and our trucks in there. Mm -hmm. But for like a month before, we had to take the trucks and everything down the river, scrape every bit of mud off and dirt, mm -hmm. and had to clean them all up because they didn't want that crap on their boat. <laughs> so we worked on that and got all cleaned up and then got, got on the boat. And nine days later, after going like this for nine mm -hmm. days, it was a flat bottom, you know. Didn't ride too good. Uh, we got in uh, Okinawa, and uh, the the base there was just across from a little village called Kim, mm -hmm. Kim Village. Yep. And uh, we, I'm not sure how long we spent there, but then they deployed us to, it wasn't very long, a couple of weeks or a month, uh, they deployed us to uh, Mount Fuji, Japan, for cold weather training. And of course, everybody got sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, they come from tropics, to zero weather, everybody was sick, flu, colds. It was a disaster. So you didn't get much of a chance to enjoy being in Japan. No, not really. Uh, we got one uh, one leave one time where uh, some of us guys got together and we went to Yokohama, mm -hmm. went to a fancy restaurant, and you know, just kind of took in the sights of the city, and you know that was fun. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, at most time, we were we were trying to do maneuvers right. out there in the in the winter time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was hard because it was really cold, and you just you just spent months over there in the tropics trying to get used to that. Yes. Now you got to get used to this. <laughs> right. But, yeah, that, and we had you know, and 
a lot of guys there weren't weren't from Michigan like me. They didn't know how to drive on that ice and snow, you know. Now, did you have the M105s with you when you were doing yeah. this? Okay, yeah. so you had all the equipment. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, everything went with us, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I can't remember how long we spent there either. But uh, they, they uh, put us on a jet helicopter, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> it's that those babies would really mm -hmm. take off and fly, you know. And they, they got us back over to Okinawa, which isn't very far off well, part of Japan, yeah. really. Uh, and we spent a little more time there, and then, then they shipped me out uh, on an uh, airline, you yeah. know. Okay, uh, so the unit basically stayed there, but your year overseas was finished, so just, yeah, you could go back my, individually. Yeah, my year overseas, because you did a year. You know, I got pulled out of Vietnam after eight months, but I had four more months to go. Right. Now, when you were on Okinawa, what did they have you doing? Just crap, you know, just sweeping floors, uh, working in the mess, uh, guard duty, uh, motor pool duty, you know, just crap that they had to keep you busy. You okay. But when you were off duty, could you go off base and... Yeah. Yeah, I went into Kim Village a lot, yeah. Yeah, me and a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Ironwing was his name. He was full-blood Cherokee, and uh, he was quite a character. But we got in there and found out that those uh, Okinawans, they weren't very good at pool playing, but they loved to play pool. Mm -hmm. so we made a few bucks off those guys. <laughs> so Had fun doing that. Better recreational opportunities. Oh, yeah, in, yeah. In, in yeah. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of bars there, you know, yeah. and... Drinking and mm. women. Yes, women. <laughs> My wife's going to see this, so I don't want to. Yeah, well, we're her and all like women there. Yeah. <laughs> they just created problems for the other guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, in a way, it was at least about halfway to a vacation, maybe compared to being in the rock pile. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 weren't, you weren't really planning on getting shot at there, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Now, how far were you in your enlistment by the time that you finished your year overseas? So you leave Okinawa. Do you have to go back to the U.S. for a yep. while? Yeah, I went back to Jacksonville, uh, well, outside of Camp Lejeune. Okay. Uh, North Carolina there. Right. And I had three months left to go. Well, they were they were sending a lot of guys home early. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't send me home early. I had three months to go. And... I did the same thing there, just worked in, uh, in the motor pool, mm -hmm. guard duty, mess duty, armory, motor pool, mess duty, mm -hmm. you know, and it jumped around for, you know, every couple of weeks or, okay. so I would, I would switch. Okay. When you got back, okay, when you get, when you get back from Okinawa, so you fly out another commercial jet, you fly back into California, uh, but and you're landing actually on a, on a military base, right? Yes. So you're, you're not going to a civilian airport. Now, yeah. at that point then, uh, do you go home before you go out to North yeah, Carolina? Yeah, I did. I had 30 days of leave, yeah. Okay. I went home. And then I had to go back for my last three months. Okay. And so where did you, did you fly back to Michigan and then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then did you fly? But now you're flying on civilian aircraft. And right, so forth again. right. Now, did you go in uniform or in civilian clothes? I was in uniform. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And did you run into any trouble in the airports or places like that? No, I, n I never did. Mm -hmm. I know guys that did, though. Yeah. My brother-in-law did, too. They mm -hmm. were, but he came in like LAX, yeah. you know, and they were there with their rotten tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, he was, he didn't care for that too yeah. much. But I, somehow or other, I was protected. I mm -hmm. got in there on a... You know, real, real early in the morning, because they'd be outside the base too. Mm -hmm. You know, but of course they couldn't come on base. So. Right. But then, uh, yeah, I went home for the 30 days, come back, did my three months, and uh, and just went home. Okay. But I still had, I still had uh, four years as uh, the reserve obligation. A reserve, you know. Yeah. But inactive. Because you got six years, yeah. period. Yeah. But I was in active reserve. And I never got called again for anything, so right. that was it, two years. And it's really good that it happened, the full two years, because if, if you spend one day less than two years in, uh, in the our, our Marine Corps mm -hmm. or Army, you can't qualify for VA benefits. Mm -hmm. And so that's why 
God made me stay there. So right. I get VA benefits when I retire. Okay. Now, had you, uh, did they make any effort to have you re-enlist or extend or anything oh, like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what would they offer? Oh, you know, another rank, more money, that kind of thing, you know. But I told them, I got, I got money waiting for me at home. I got mm -hmm. a job I can do and uh, a girlfriend I want to marry, so mm -hmm. no thank you. All right. So what, what kind of job did you have waiting for you? Or? Well, I didn't really have it waiting for me. I had to find it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it took a while, too, because, uh, you know, I'll be, unbeknownst to me, for some reason, I was, uh, I wasn't in the know about how people felt, really, about the war, I mm -hmm. guess. And I went and put in lots of applications for truck driving all mm -hmm. over Holland and mm -hmm. even Grand Rapids and that. And I had a hard time getting hired because I'd put veteran on there, okay. you not veteran. And, but at the time, I didn't really realize that was a, you know, a, a holdback. Now looking back at it, I know that it was, yeah, okay. just by what people were saying to me, you know. But uh, yeah, finally a guy gave me a, a job uh, uh, for a Zealand blacktop company, and we blacktopped uh, uh, driveways and parking lots and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So he gave me my first truck driving, civilian truck driving okay. job, dump truck. Right. <laughs> okay. Now, aside from just the initial trouble getting a job, did you have any real problems adjusting to civilian life once you come out of the Marine Corps? Mm. Well, I guess I guess I felt a little angry. I, I think you know I. Uh, I wasn't really looking for fights or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I was kind of keeping my eyes open for the chance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was, uh, was kind of an angry young guy, but that all changed with age. You know. You, did, did you have you to? Mellow. Did you have to clean up your language? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. I, I always have tried not to be too. Too much with the swear words, mm -hmm. but it yeah it does have, especially if I get hurt, you know, bang yeah. a thumb on the hammer, you know, then it slips out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, and aside from you know being able to use VA benefits and things, you know, later on in life, uh, what do you think you took out of the experience of, of, of being in the service? How did that affect you, or what did you learn from it? Well. Um, I guess the top of the list would be learning how to drive trucks, you know, and and uh, I felt that I was pretty good at it, so that's what I went after when I got home was was truck driving. But uh, yeah, uh, as far as uh, like PTSD, I didn't really know I had any PTSD. I didn't know. I never mm -hmm. heard of it, you know, before, but. I, I locked up with another friend of mine that went through high school with, and uh, he uh, he went through Army, uh, Army uh, Airborne, and he had PTSD mm -hmm. real bad. And he was telling me about it. We went out to dinner, my wife and him and his wife, mm -hmm. and he started talking about how he felt, you know, about this and that, and I, that sounds like me, mm -hmm. you know. And as he kept talking, I kept thinking. Yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> Not really wanting to get in any crowds. Yeah. Uh, sitting with your back towards the door in a restaurant, you know, just things like that. And so and I started, he, he got me going over there to the VA okay. clinic and, and going, going for, uh, you know, uh, the uh, benefits. Right. And... Uh, because if it hadn't been for him, I probably still wouldn't be. Yeah. Well, it's the sort of thing where, you know, when you think of PTSD, you assume it's necessarily, you know, it's the combat veterans and so forth, people getting shot at all oh, the no, time. It's... But on a practical level, I, I, I mean, I've been talking to Vietnam veterans, I found that people with all kinds of different jobs, and it's just, there's still a fairly high level of stress that you're in for that period of time. And certain mm -hmm. things happen, whether it's the guy being cut in half by the piece yeah. of sheet metal or whatever yeah. it might be, yeah. uh, or other stuff that, that's just not, what one normally expects to deal with, and that right. that gets absorbed one place or another, and it just depends on you know how your brain works for 
how that happens. But but that part there where you start listening to the symptoms and going, oh, that's yeah, me. That that's yeah, me. that can happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it isn't just veterans either. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, anyone that's been in a bad car wreck, right. uh, that's been hurt or or had somebody killed mm-hmm. in a car wreck with them, or that that's all. You know, yeah, you get trauma. PTSD. Yeah. I mean, if a dog attacks you, you could have PTSD after you sort things out mm-hmm. and go, oh, that was nasty, you know. A lot of people are walking around with PTSD yep. and don't even know it. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, and it's certainly we, we now have that issue with people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. Yeah, and, and, and a lot and of them are coming back with it. Yeah. They finally, the government finally admits to... Mm-hmm. That I mean, before in uh, like World War II, it was uh, shell shock. Yeah, or combat fatigue, or combat whatever they're calling it. You know, they call it something different mm-hmm. every war, but yeah. and they probably will but, after yeah, this. I, I think there's a new term that's replaced PTSD already. You know, so <laughs> probably. That, you know, they, they keep adding <laughs> syllables or whatever. But yeah, yeah. So <laughs> some old George Carlin routine about that. They keep changing it and making <laughs> more syllables so it doesn't sound as bad. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, do you think that uh, being in the Marines, do you think you learn much about, you know, yourself or dealing with other people or that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, 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 I felt that I, I could handle more stuff. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, I just matured. Yeah. You know, because when I went in when I was 17, I was just a kid. Yeah. Just a kid in high school, thought I knew everything. Mm-hmm. My dad didn't know nothing. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I wanted to get out of there. Yep. Didn't want to go to college, which I should have done. If I had to do over again, I would have. But uh, yeah, I just uh, how to handle myself and uh, yeah, hopefully be a better person. You know. All right. Well, you've done a good job of telling us your your story and just another side of what kinds of things people experience in Vietnam. So yeah. thanks for coming in and sharing the story. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate it. I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs>